Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College, and I'm going to go over the functions of the cardiovascular centers in the brain. They're all located in the medulla of the brain. They include the cardio acceleratory center, the cardio inhibitory center, and then we'll also add the vasomotor center. And we'll see how they work together with the baroreceptors that are located um, in the major arteries nearby the heart and how all, they, all of them work together to regulate our systemic blood pressure. Before we dive into our discussion on blood pressure, let's first make sure we all understand what regulates cardiac output. So let's begin by reviewing the formula for cardiac output. Cardiac output is the product of stroke volume and heart rate. And then we can rewrite stroke volume as the difference between EDV and ESV. EDV stands for end diastolic volume, the volume of blood left in the heart after the heart has finished relaxing, so right before it starts to contract. While the end systolic, vol systolic volume is, of course, the volume of blood that is left in the heart after the heart has fully contracted. So in all of us, we always have some blood left in the heart, even after full contractions. Some of us have more, some of us have less. It all depends on the condition of the heart, um, the condition of the, the, the person. And of course, we multiply this by heart rate. So let's say you're given a question on an exam or a scenario where you, after reading the question several times, you've listened to the scenario several times, you realize, okay, the main problem with my patient or in this patient is that the cardiac output in the patient is dropping. So let's make a little note to ourselves here. So cardiac output is dropping. Well, what do we need to see happening? Well, somehow the body needs to respond in such a way such that cardiac output comes back up. So how do we do that? Well, simple. We can either increase heart rate, right? Or we can increase stroke volume. Or we can do both, right? Because look at the formula. In the formula, we see that both stroke volume and heart rate um, form a product that equals cardiac output. So if we increase one of those factors, we're already going to increase cardiac output. So what are the various ways we can increase heart rate or increase stroke volume? And so that, this is where our discussion now turns to the two cardiac centers that we find in the medulla of the brain, the cardio acceleratory center and the cardio inhibitory center. In just a little bit, we're going to add a blood vessel center called the vasomotor center, but we're not quite ready for that yet. So notice that, first of all, this whole flowchart is by no means comprehensive. There are additional factors, and I'm going to squeeze in uh, one or maybe a couple more factors that can impact cardiac output, but we're going to keep it relatively simple. And so the first thing to start out with is the following, and that is that the cardio acceleratory center is always in a communication with the sympathetic nervous system. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system is always in communication with the cardio inhibitory center. Cardio acceleratory, sympathetic, cardio inhibitory, parasympathetic nervous system. In this scenario, we're going to look at what happens when the cardio acceleratory center actually stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. And under normal conditions, what will typically happen then is that the cardio inhibitory center is going to inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system. So notice what we're seeing here. The cardio inhibitory center inhibits the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So what that all means is the following. If the cardio acceleratory center stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, that's going to trigger the sympathetic fibers, the adrenal gland, to release norepinephrine, and in the case of the adrenal gland, also epinephrine. So those are the typical neurotransmitters of the sympathetic nervous system. Don't ever forget this. Recall, too, that you can easily remember what the sympathetic nervous system does 
because we give it the nickname of fight or flight, right? Which refers to the fact that this is the nervous system that kicks in when we are under stress, whether we're taking a very difficult exam or we need to run for our life, we're working out at the gym, um, or we need to fight back, right? What are the things that happen? And clearly, during the time of an active sympathetic nervous system, we see that our blood starts really flowing and our heart starts pumping harder. So let's take a look at these effects. So indeed, these hormones slash neurotransmitters are going to be able to increase the heart rate, right, by causing uh, faster depolarizations. But they're also going to impact the cardiac muscle tissue in a different way. And I've listed here just one, contractility, and we'll add another one here in just a moment. So what do we mean by contractility? Contractility refers to the fact that some kind of extrinsic factors, factors that come from outside of the heart, are going to cause the heart muscle cells to contract harder. That is what we mean by contractility. And what are these extrinsic factors? These neurotransmitters, or you can call them hormones. But we also see that an intrinsic mechanism can cause the heart muscle to contract more. And this is what results from the fact that norepinephrine and epinephrine can also cause for, and I'm just going to draw an arrow like that, I know it's getting a little messy, but they're, they're going to result, they're going to cause, I should say, vasoconstriction. And this vasoconstriction is going to especially cause for more blood to return to the heart. So we have an increase in venous return. And if we see more blood return to the heart, that is going to do two things. First of all, it's going to increase our end diastolic volume. Oops. Right, end diastolic volume. And as the end diastolic volume increases, of course, that results into an increase in stroke volume. But the increase in venous return causes heart muscle to stretch. So muscle cells are stretch, stretched more. And this is the Frank Starling principle. This is what we refer to as an increase in preload. In other words, this results into the heart squeezing more such that, again, a little messy here, such that we now see the heart squeezing so hard that less blood is left behind after contraction. So we see a drop in ESV. And how does that impact stroke volume? It's going to increase it, right? Let's come back here to this formula. This is stroke volume. How can you increase stroke volume? Well, you can either cause this number to go up, leave this one alone, cause this one to come up, or you can make this one smaller and keep this the same. Or you could make this one bigger and this one smaller. So those are the multiple ways in which we can change stroke volume. So we've now talked about preload as well as contractility. Make sure that you distinguish between these two. So that's the impact of the sympathetic nervous system when it's activated by the cardioacceleratory center in response to a dropping cardiac output. But at the same time, we're going to see that the parasympathetic nervous system will work opposite. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are typically antagonistic branches of the nervous system. So as one, if one is turned on, the other one is turned off and vice versa. So the cardioinhibitory center always communicates only with the parasympathetic nervous system. And what is it going to want to do if the sympathetic nervous system is activated? It's going to want to make sure that the parasympathetic nervous system is not activated. So we're going to inhibit it. And if we 
inhibits the parasympathetic nervous system. It literally means that it, the fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system will not secrete their neurotransmitter. What is the neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system? Acetylcholine. So when parasympathetic fibers are inhibited, we're not going to see any acetylcholine released. And consequently, when we don't see acetylcholine released onto the heart, we're going to see that that allows for the heart to not be slowed down. So we're going to see an increase in heart rate. We're going to see that it's not going to cause the heart to not contract as much. In other words, we're going to see an increase in contractility. And we're not going to see an impact on um, vasodilation or constriction because acetylcholine does not uh, impact vessels because remember the parasympathetic nervous system does not communicate does not no in, does not innervate or I should say does not innervate vessels so the parasympathetic nervous system cannot impact vasoconstriction or vasodilation Let's now take a look at the scenario where your patient is experiencing, experiencing an increase in cardiac output. And of course, ultimately, what needs to happen that this patient's cardiac output decreases. Well, if the patient's cardiac output is increasing too much, um, we want to bring it down by bringing down its, his heart rate or her stroke volume. And we've looked at the various things that impact stroke volume. I'm not going to add all the ones that I discussed earlier. You can do that yourself. Let's just keep this simple. So this time, we're not going to want to get that sympathetic nervous system going. Because once the sympathetic nervous system gets going, heart rate, stroke volume go up. We don't want that to happen. So this time the cardiovascular, I'm sorry, the cardioacceleratory center is going to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. That means that these neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and epinephrine, are not released, and therefore we don't see any of these factors increase. On the other hand, the cardioinhibitory center is now going to make sure that the parasympathetic nervous system gets going. Because if the cardiac output is too high, we need to somehow slow down the heart rate, slow down the stroke volume. And that's where the parasympathetic nervous system can do a good job with the help of acetylcholine. Once acetylcholine lands onto the heart, it starts to depolarize slower. In addition to that, the acetylcholine will inhibit the cardiac muscle cells from, from contracting so much. And of course, that's all ultimately going to... Um, reduce our cardiac output. So now we're ready to take a look at our blood pressure formula, which I have um, spelled out for you here near the top. And remember that blood pressure is the product of cardiac output and peripheral resistance. You can spell or you can, you can uh, write out cardiac output as the product of stroke volume and heart rate times Still peripheral resistance, of course, to get to the blood pressure formula. And you know very well that we can also rewrite stroke volume as EDV minus ESV. We just did that on the previous slides. So we're going to start with a scenario where the blood pressure in a patient is, be is beginning to drop or has been dropping. And so how will the body, the patient's body respond to bring that blood pressure back up? Well, if we look at our formula, we see three main components. And if we can increase one of these factors, clearly that is going to increase blood pressure. So we could try to bring up the peripheral resistance. We can try to bring up the stroke volume. We can try to bring up the heart rate. And these two we've already discussed um, before on the previous slide. So this whole branch here or this half is really a repeat of what we did a little bit ago. And then we're going to add the effects of the vasomotor center. But before we can go over the whole flow chart, I do need to address uh, baroreceptors. And so baroreceptors, you may recall, are located at the base of the major vessels that leave the heart, like the carotid arteries and the aorta. So we talk about the carotid sinuses and the, 
the sinus of the aorta. And they're sensory receptors. You've learned about sensory receptors. And they're sensitive to changes in the blood pressure. Uh, and how exactly? Well, because they're located in the walls of the blood vessels, they're going to detect how much the blood vessel walls are being stretched or not stretched. So let's say that blood pressure is rising in a patient. How does that, oops, how... How does that impact the stretch in the blood vessel walls? Well, the blood vessel walls are going to stretch, right? And how will the baroreceptors respond? Baroreceptors are going to say, oh, we're not going to send any action potentials to the cardiovascular centers. So we're going to see that there's not going to be action potentials flying down the sensory neurons towards the cardiovascular centers. And so the opposite is true in case we see a, um, let's say that we see a drop in blood pressure. In this case, we're, we're going to see that there is um, the blood vessel walls do not stretch. I'll just do it this way, in red. And when they do not stretch, how do the baroreceptors respond? They will send action potentials down to the cardiovascular centers and alert them of the fact that the blood pressure is dropping. And so that is the scenario that we're looking at here. So when our systemic blood pressure begins to drop, the baroreceptors are going to send action potentials via sensory neurons to our various centers. And each one of our centers is going to respond appropriately. So our blood pressure is dropping, we need to bring it back up, which means we need to bring up our cardiac output via all of these factors here. And so it makes sense that our cardioacceleratory center is going to activate our sympathetic nervous system to increase contractility, to increase heart rate. On the other hand, our cardio inhibitory center is going to make sure that parasympathetic nervous system cannot dump acetylcholine onto the heart and slow down the heart rate and slow down uh, or, or decrease its contractility, right? So we've already studied this aspect of the chart, as we mentioned. So what about the vasomotor center? Well, the vasomotor center is also going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. And that is going to, again, release our, um, our norepinephrine and epinephrine from the fibers, as well as our adrenal medulla, such that vasoconstriction increases, peripheral resistance increases, and of course that is going to impact our blood pressure based on our formula here that shows that peripheral resistance, when it increases, can increase our blood pressure. Let's look now at the opposite scenario where your patient's blood pressure is rising, and I'm purposely using the exact same flowchart by correcting things in the opposite direction of where things were going when blood pressure was dropping. If blood pressure is rising in your patient, we want to bring it down. And of course, how do we do that? We can follow our formula and see that we need to therefore change stroke volume or heart rate or peripheral resistance, or all three of them, why not? Um, so if we focus on our cardio acceleratory center, that's always the easier one, in my opinion, to start out with. We're going to want to calm down that sympathetic nervous system because if we can calm it down or inhibit it, then we're going to see that the heart won't contract as hard and our heart won't beat as fast. And of course, both of these are going to then bring down our cardiac output and therefore blood pressure. Whatever the sympathetic nervous system undergoes, in this case it's being inhibited, 
that is typically also what your vasomotor center is going to do to the sympathetic nervous system. So your vasomotor center literally helps out or works, I think of, of both these two centers um, being allies, they work together. So the vasomotor center is also going to calm down the sympathetic nervous system and therefore we're going to have much less vasoconstriction, peripheral resistance goes down and therefore our blood pressure goes down. And so what happens with the cardio inhibitory center, it's going to do the opposite of the other two. It is going to activate the parasympathetic fibers such that acetylcholine is released and of course that's going to calm down the heart, slow down the heart rate and therefore our uh, cardiac output goes down and consequently the blood pressure will go down. I hope that by visiting these charts in, in more detail like this, uh, it was a little bit easier for you to follow the impacts that the various centers have. And remember too, on the previous slide, I discussed that when baroreceptors are not stretched, that's when they start alerting the three cardiovascular centers and they respond accordingly.